Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Trouble Begins at 5.30, brought to you by the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. As always, I'm Jody DeBrine, the Director of Collections, and I am so happy to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, we have to first thank uh, the Center for Mark Twain Studies at Elmira College in Elmira, New York. Um, for sponsoring the Trouble Weekends programs. We are so thankful for their support uh, year after year. Uh, the couple admin things before we get started. First, many of you have already found the chat feature on the side of your screen. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves and gossip in there um, as the program goes on. Um, but if you have a question for Kevin, uh, please use the ask a question feature down at the bottom of your screen. We already have five questions in there and we haven't even started, so that's a good sign. Um, right above that ask a question feature is a greenish bluish uh, button um, that says your support is vital to the Mark Twain House Museum. Please donate here. Um, you know, everybody got hit hard by COVID, so every dollar counts. Um, and we're not just saying that. Um, we are open to the public again, but, um, you know, if you can support us in any way, we would greatly appreciate it. And if you can't support us there, we hope that you come and visit us and support us by buying a ticket to get a tour. Um, the last thing that I will say before I introduce Kevin to you is that this program is going to be unlike anyone that we've done so far. Um, it is active. It is moving. We are going to be literally touring Kevin's space. So the camera may go in and out of focus a little bit as we move, but please just be patient with that. We're going to do as best as we can. Um, that's not something in our control. So, but, um, all the test runs have been really good and um, I hope you guys enjoy it. I know I'm going to. So without further ado, we have Kevin McDonald here tonight. He is a uh, Austin-based Twain scholar and collector. Um, he has one of the largest collections of Twainiana and um, he is just gonna be showing us around his collection, his archive, his library tonight. And I, for one, I'm so excited. Um, so we're just gonna get a little snippet of what he has to, to offer. And Kevin, I'm gonna go off screen and take it away. Thank you, Jody. Uh, welcome to the virtual tour. Uh, I'm gonna give you a brief overview before we get started. I'm standing in the stairwell of the, between the second and third floors that lead up to the third floor where my library is housed. There are about 10,000 items in the collection in all, over 8,000 of them are cataloged. The reason that the count is higher is not because I'm behind in cataloging, but because some of these single catalog items are archives that may consist of several hundred items, like 250 letters that Clara Clemens, Twain's daughter, wrote to the Gilder family, or 130 photographs taken during Twain's last lecture tour across the United States. But those count as a single catalog item, but in terms of the total count, it adds up to much more. I'm going to try to anticipate some of the questions that I'm frequently asked uh, and that might be asked tonight and give you kind of an overview of what's in the collection. Uh, very briefly, I have a little over 100 personal possessions that belong to Mark Twain, all with rock solid provenances. I'm picky about that. I've got about 200 original letters written by Mark Twain. I have 543 or more letters written by Clara. I have about 250 letters written by Jean, Livy, and other people in the household. I have about 600 photographs from Twain's lifetime. Two thirds of those are of Twain himself. The others are of members of the family. I have another 200 of other people associated with Twain. And I have about 600 photographs uh, in the Warner Brothers archive that belong to Jack Warner personally <clears throat> that he had taken in anticipation of the 1944 movie, uh, The Adventures of Mark Twain. And I have a couple of hundred letters from Clara Clemens personal archive and from the Langdon family archives that were written after Twain's death uh, and letters by other people, um, I'm sorry, photo, photographs. And those uh, photographs total about 1800 items. I have about 60 linear feet of American first editions of, of Mark Twain. You're gonna see those. Uh, 40 of those volumes are inscribed by Mark Twain to people who were important in his life. I have Mark Twain's own copies of eight of his books. We'll see those too. I have reprints of some of Mark Twain's works, uh, more than a dozen that are inscribed by Twain. I have 18 or 20 inscribed photographs of Twain. I have 205 titles from Twain's library 
totaling about 341 volumes. And the reason the volume count is higher is because some of those titles are sets. Those are single volumes, but they also include sets. So there's 205 discrete catalog items, totaling 341 volumes. I have an additional 50 volumes from the Langdon Family Library. Uh, Langdon's were Twain's in-laws at Quarry Farm, and he had access to their library. Some of those 50 volumes are annotated by Twain. He read them. I have 59 Mark Twain comic book first printings. I have about 150 flyers for first editions of Mark Twain's works. I have more than 300 postcards from Mark Twain's lifetime. I have more than 100 menus, tickets, invitations, and even some seating charts and party favors from the various dinners and lectures that Twain gave over the years. I have about 150 trade cards issued during Twain's lifetime that have his name or image on them to advertise various products. I have 138 miniature books um, of Mark Twain's works, and I don't even like miniature books. I have about 3,000 post-1935 books about Twain, memoirs, scholarly works, biographies, things like that. Those are kept on the second floor next to my office because I use those more often. And I keep everything that I can in chronological order. With that preamble, I'm going to go ahead and head toward the main library and we'll get started. I began collecting Twain in 1968. And I should mention I use a lot of the items uh, in my research. I also uh, lend images of many of the items to scholars and researchers. I should also mention for anybody interested in conservation that all of the broadsides, photographs, um, uh, documents, letters uh, that I have are either in L sleeves made out of mylar or polypropylene as appropriate. I do not encapsulate and I certainly don't slab anything. I have UV filters on all of the windows on the third floor and most of the windows in our house. I use only incandescent bulbs to avoid fluorescent light, which produces UV. Um, temperature and humidity control is, is strict here. I uh, do better at the humidity at 50%. I don't keep the temperature at the ideal 50%, but I try to keep it cool. There are some questions I won't answer about security precautions, uh, the alarm monitoring. I don't like to discuss specific uh, values of specific items. I can say that the collection uh, in total is worth several million dollars, conservatively. I can. I also don't discuss the terms of my will or the disposition of the, of the uh, library because I'm still alive and I plan to live another 30 years. Things could change. And I certainly never discuss the price I've paid for an item because my wife Donna is filming this for me. And uh, after 46 years of marriage, I'd like there to be a few more years. So with that said, let's get started. The first editions in this book are all shelved on these shelves. As we move around the room, that's 60 linear feet. Over here, mostly photographs and letters. Up on top, smoking paraphernalia, most of it from Twain's lifetime, the cigar boxes and advertising. And over there is all of the other books about Twain. That would include first printings and other people's books, contributions to anthologies, biographies, any book that talks about Twain, mentions Twain. It would be memoirs written by people who um, have a memoir of Twain, published a letter he wrote to them, a chapter about Twain. It includes scholarly studies, biographies. It's basically everything else, and it's all in chronological order. In the first section, I should point out that most of Twain's books up until he signed a contract with Harper's in the 1890s were published by subscription. That means they came out in different bindings that subscribers could buy. The bindings were usually a sheet binding, half Morocco bindings, full leather bindings of Morocco, and various cloth bindings. And I have all of those books um, in the various bindings and all of the issues. Twain's first book was Celebrated Jumping Frog, it came in a brown cloth, it came in a purple cloth, a green cloth, a plum cloth, and a blue cloth. And I have first issue copies in pretty nice shape of all of those, second issue copies of some other colors. Innocents Abroad, I have all three states of the prospectus. And I have a copy that Twain inscribed one of his partners in the Buffalo Express. I also have Thomas Nass copy, I, who, who once planned a lecture tour with Twain. I also have Charles Dudley Warner's copy, who co-wrote the Gilded Age with Mark Twain. The next book up is Roughing It. I have a copy inscribed by Twain to a man in England who hosted him. I have uh, The Gilded Age, 
I have a review copy uh, in, that was unbound and sent out. I have Mark Twain's own copy of The Gilded Age with his annotations. And the next section, you might wonder who would have a dozen copies of The Gilded Age, uh, what same person would have them. Well, I have those because unlike his other books, which included an imprint of Hartford followed by a bunch of cities, the Gilded Age was published with separate imprints, Hartford in New York, Hartford in Philadelphia, Hartford in San Francisco, and so on. So in order to have every bibliographical variant, I have one of each of those. There are a lot of different variants of sketches, new and old. I have Twain's own copy of the book annotated for the lecture circuit, and I have a presentation copy. Tom Sawyer, I think we all know Tom Sawyer. Tramp Abroad, I have an, all of the bindings plus an experimental blue binding. I have a copy, that Twain's own copy, and I have a copy that he gave to John T. Lewis, who I'll explain later. Also have Prince and the Pauper. We have personal memoirs of Grant inscribed to a friend of Twain, Mark Twain's Library of Humor, inscribed to Fred Grant, General Grant's son. I have Twain's own copy of Prince and the Pauper. I have all the variants of Life in the Mississippi. I have all four variants of the prospectus for Huckleberry Finn and all the bindings for Huckleberry Finn. I have a copy of Huckleberry Finn that Twain gave to his banker. I have all the variants of Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, including two presentation copies, one inscribed to a man who worked on the page typesetter. Some of the scholars out there will recognize the significance of that one. I have Follow the Equator, Twain's last travel book, a copy inscribed to uh, Katie uh, Leary, who is Twain's personal uh, maid, house servant for 30 years, the limited signed edition as well. And in the next section, I have uh, most of the late books. I have a copy of the Million Pound Banknote and the Dust Jacket. It's the earliest Twain first edition I've ever located in a jacket. I have a copy of Tom Sawyer Broad, uh, a copy of Million Pound Banknote, American Claimant, and Connecticut Yankee, all inscribed by Dan Beard, who was the illustrator for each of those books, explaining something about his illustrations in them. I have presentation copies of um, Double Barrel Detective Story, a uh, copy of The Jumping Frog inscribed uh, after Twain was on his way back from getting his Oxford degree, a copy of uh, Adam's Diary inscribed to the doctor who attended Livy on her deathbed, and I have Kate Leary's copy of Eve's Diary, which was Mark Twain's tribute to his wife Livy. I also have Twain's own copy of Their Husband's Wives, a copy of the $30,000 bequest inscribed to Twain's friend Joe Twitchell, copy of Christian Science given to somebody uh, he met in uh, Oxford at a dinner or at London when he was on his way to Oxford for that dinner. I have all the prospectuses for the collected editions of Mark Twain. You'll notice a lot, a lot of the books I have are in dust jackets and that, that's, that's a good feature to have because and the reason I have several of them is because they are in different states of the jacket. I've pulled a few things from the shelf to show particular books to you uh, to kind of give you a general idea of the flavor of what I do have. A copy of Twain's first book, The Celebrated Jumping Frog in Red Cloth. It's inscribed by Twain to John Riley, who was the man that Twain hired to help him with the second book. But Riley got cancer and died. So the book they planned on South African diamond mines never came to fruition. I have an early edition of Huckleberry Finn inscribed to somebody whose name may be familiar to some of you, Orion Clemens, Twain's brother. I also have Orion Clemens' copy of The Gilded Age. Orion was a character in The Gilded Age. I also have a number of letters that pertain to Huckleberry Finn. This letter written to a young lady who wrote to Twain, and he says he trusts her opinion of the book being young and being a child more than he trusts the opinion of 50 preachers. And that's a nice letter because Twain always um, saw through the innocent eye of childhood instead of religious camp and social decorum. This is a, a letter that Twain wrote to his typist about punctuation and how to type up the manuscript of Huckleberry Finn. A letter Twain wrote uh, giving his opinion. He was wounded by a gratuitous stab, he called it, of the first newspaper notice of Huckleberry Finn that he read after he got back from the Twain cable tour. He also wrote a letter in response to somebody who sent him a newspaper clipping attacking his book, claiming that Huckleberry Finn had inspired a young man to a life of crime and the kid was killed while committing a burglary and the headline was Mark Twain kills a boy. I took that headline as the title of an essay I wrote and investigated the truth, uh, the degree of truth in that story. But this is the 
letter that got me started in that research where Twain is saying, thank you for that sermon from the Republic, I shall reform now and write no more books like that one. And these are miscellaneous notes that Twain wrote in anticipation of a sequel to Huckleberry Finn, including his notes about uh, the love life of Aunt Polly. Who knew? And then memoirs of Grant in the leather binding. These are, this set is inscribed to John T. Lewis, who was a hero to Twain. John T. Lewis was a black man born a free man, not a slave, but Twain mistakenly thought that he was a slave for much of the time. And he chose this book of all books to give to John T. Lewis, among some others. And I think it's one of my favorite books simply because I think John T. Lewis, uh, among the three black men of, who have been proposed as models for Jim, is the one who is Jim closest to being Jim's spiritual model. And I wrote that up in an essay called Was Huck Quaker? Because John T. Lewis was a Dunker Baptist. And if you look at Quaker religion and the Dunker Baptist religion, they are very closely allied. They're pacifist and they don't swear oaths and a lot of other similarities. And I wrote an essay about the Quaker themes in Huckleberry Finn. These are Clemens family letters to and from family members, Twain, his daughter, and Livy. A letter about John T. Lewis that he wrote to his sister-in-law, Susan Crane. A New Year's greeting card that he sent to his sister-in-law. A letter he wrote to his wife, drawing a mountain that he climbed in the Alps. Uh, more letters to Livy. Uh, Clara Clemens' birth certificate signed by Joe Twitchell and witnessed by an old guy named S.L. Clemens over in the corner. And other letters to Livy, uh, telegrams, postcards, envelopes, and also letters to his daughters. But I keep those separate from the other Twain letters because they're family. A man important in Twain's life was Henry Rogers. This is a uh, uh, electrolyte, electrotype plate that Twain gave to Rogers at his 1902 birthday dinner, Twain's dinner. And he wrote to him, he said, I, uh, I owe you much love and am good for the interest but cannot pay the principal. Uh, Rogers had helped Twain overcome his financial difficulties. It seems like every scholar, every biographer that writes about Twain calls every girlfriend that Twain had a sweetheart. But the def definition of sweetheart in the 19th century was a woman that you were serious about and that it might lead to an engagement and even marriage. And so a lot of those girlfriends and flings that Twain had were not really sweethearts. But Twain's own picture of he and Laura Hawkins Frazier, who was the model for Becky Thatcher, Twain inscribed in 1908 with her name and said, my first sweetheart, I was seven and she five. Twain's next sweetheart was a woman named Iowa Burns. And I discovered a photograph of her with some family notes scratched on the uh, on the image and a note attached to it describing her as a sweetheart. So I investigated Iowa Burns and found, lo and behold, Twain knew her, wrote a poem about her, went to church with her. Uh, starts to sound like the way he wooed Libby, especially the church angle. And I, I wrote an article about it called Mark Twain's Lost Sweetheart. And of course, the sweetheart that counts is the sweetheart he married. That's the Bundy portrait of Libby in Hartford. And this is Twain's own copy of that image. It came out of an archive of about 30 photographs that Twain and Livy kept. And this was Twain's image of Livy. From that same archive is Livy's photograph of Twain that he sent her for her birthday in 1893. Now he liked that picture and he, he inscribed it November 27, uh, a day dear to SLC. He liked the picture to start with but as time went by, he changed his mind. Someone wrote him a letter and said he looked like a gorilla. And the next time he autographed a copy, a postcard for somebody that stuck it under his nose, he inscribed it ostensibly Mark Twain. But he wasn't through. By 1908, when the booklet appeared commemorating his 1902 birthday thing, uh, celebration, they used it as a frontispiece without his knowledge. And when he saw it, he wrote underneath it. Of course, they would frontispiece it with this damned old libel and he goes on and on and dates it 1908 and initials it. So he ended up sending the picture to his wife at first uh, and then backing off of it and then absolutely detesting the picture. Twain's last travel, book, well, let's start with his first travel book. Twain's first travel book was Innocence Abroad. And it was the result of traveling on the uh, Quaker City this is a prospectus for that excursion, which was the first American pleasure cruise. This is a ticket sold to William James, not the philosopher related to Henry James, but the man who was the official photographer for the trip. 
That man was one of what Twain called the American vandals abroad because every place they visited, they chipped pieces off of everything. And I have pieces of the pyramids, the Colosseum at Rome, the Acropolis in Greece, and so on and so forth, even the Sphinx. And he made a list of all of his vandalisms, and I have all of those in about eight Riker mounts. And after the, <clears throat> the trip, he produced a uh, advertisement for all of the pictures that he took and offered them for sale. And I have his proofs and his original photographs uh, that he took for that trip of all the sites they saw, including one of Twain. Twain's last travel book was following the equator. And this is an interesting um, relic that gives us a glimpse into the way Twain composed his books, the creative process. This is a list of topics with page numbers referencing books that he read in preparation for writing following the equator so that he'd have them at you know, very handy. Uh, these are not as well organized, but these are certainly neat. And those were page referenced. Further along, he kind of storyboarded it and just put a list of topics outlining it based upon what he had on the first board. I don't know that anyone has done a, a in-depth study of the composition of following the equator, but those would be helpful. And a transcript of those is at the Mark Twain papers. Twain's fame spread and this book is interesting because it's a collector of photographs who in 1874, he was sending cabinet photos and carte de visite photos uh, out to celebrities, presidents, statesmen, authors, anybody he could getting their autographs. And he decided to publish his collection and he had copy prints made of every photograph in his collection, glued them into every copy, published it for a small number of his friends. And there's Mark Twain, the first time he appeared, first time his photograph appeared in a book. The first monograph about Twain was published in Copenhagen, oddly enough, and it was an advertising flyer, 16 pages with English language extracts of reviews of the Gilded Age. But it was used to advertise this book, which was a collection of sketches by Twain published in 1870, the next year in, in uh, Copenhagen, with a very strange cover that shows jumping frogs holding inkwells and pistols with arms and legs or dipping a pen into the inkwell to write. I don't get it. I don't quite understand it, but it's significant for the text uh, that advertises it because it is the first monograph on Twain. There is an online text of this available at Mark Twain Papers. The first monographs published in the United States on Twain were in 1883, which was just a little booklet, a biography of Twain, and in a brief analysis of his humor. And I guess you'd call this the first full-length book about Twain, published in Paris by Henri Gautier Villars, and it was issued in white wrappers with a little uh, parchment paper dust cover. And this was 1884, and it's 110 pages. So we jump from 16 to 32, 110 pages. So now we're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous. I collect everything pertaining to Twain. Here's Mickey Mouse in King Arthur's Court, 1933, in the dust jacket, rather scarce that way. But it's a pop-up book, so you can get pop-ups of Mickey Mouse. There is not in this book a single recognizable scene from the original book. The closest they may come is when Mickey Mouse is in a jousting uh, contest. And that's about it. And then, of course, to be really ridiculous, you always have to have oh, didn't pop up. <laughs> Sam in a box, just like Jack in the box. The next thing I can show you is this desk. If I open up, slide this out, you can see there are sliding panels underneath and I keep oversized material here, oversized magazines, newspapers, bound volumes, single newspapers. I have the Alta California, the Californian. I even have the Territorial Enterprise from February, 1863. Twain wrote two letters using his pen name, Mark Twain. Those were the first two things he assigned his pen name to, but he wrote his first piece of fiction on this date. This is the only known copy of the first printing of Twain's first work of fiction to which he assigned his name, Mark Twain. And I keep all the oversized material in there. I made this desk myself, buying three stock bookcases, each one five feet long. And on the shelves here, I have 10 linear feet of Canadian first editions. On that section, I have 15 linear feet of British first editions. And on the other side, I have 10 linear feet of 19th century translations of Twain, mostly European, French, German, uh, Danish, and even some Russian. On these shelves, 
I have carte de visites, stereo views, cabinet photographs, mostly photos and correspondence. I have Libby letters, Twain's letters to Redpath, Twain's letters to Frank Fuller, Twain's letters to Pond, not all of them, but many of them, and a lot of letters to the Gerhardts. I have the earliest known photograph of Libby Langdon, Twain's future wife, taken when she was about five years old with her younger brother, Charlie, who was a toddler. And Charlie, of course, is the man who introduced Libby to Twain through the use of a little uh, miniature ivory. We'll close these doors. Next, that brings us to what I already showed you over here. And I can just give you an idea of where it starts. I have books from New York in the 1850s, 1852, when Twain was working at a particular print shop. These are all magazines, books, and pamphlets whose type was set in that print shop at the time Twain was setting type there. We don't know which books he set type for, but he mentions the Knickerbocker and Lytell's Living Age by name uh, as being things that, he, uh, that they were printing there. I have things from Keokuk, a directory, a bunch of things from the Ben Franklin Printing Office, which was owned and operated by Orion Clemens, where Twain and his brother Henry worked. And Twain did set type for some of these things. I have the Laws of Nevada, a copy that Orion sent to somebody and copies that belonged to friends of Twain. Twain claimed to have written some of the resolutions that appear in those volumes. And then it goes on and on and on year by year uh, to everything else. We're going to move quickly past all of that material. We might stop here and point out that Twain appeared in the first edition of Who's Who in 1899. <clears throat> when I get around the corner, and that brings us up to 1912, and you can see Albert Bigelow Payne's biography, which was a watershed moment in Twain's, uh, in the publications about Twain, his official biographer. There's a set of the uh, uniform edition and a box with a label, a set of the library edition and a box of jackets. I have Clara Clemens annotated copy. I have Isabel Lyons annotated copy. I have uh, a copy that Twain gave to the man who inspired him to write the biography. I have Susan Crane's annotated copy. And of course I have Albert Ribelow Payne's personal copy and his contract with Harper Brothers for writing the book. That will bring us all the way around to 1934. And that's where the chronology ends up here. It continues downstairs. We're not gonna look at those books because they look like any professor's library, except there's more of them and they're all in pristine condition in dust jackets. The next thing I have on these shelves are the collected editions of Mark Twain. I have the limp leather library edition of Twain in the original box. It's a heavy set. They're in dust jackets and they put all 26 volumes in a single flimsy box, which is why that may be the only one that survives. I have the Gabriel Wells edition from 1922 to 1925. I have, the, there were a thousand sets. It has a sign leaf by Twain. I have the Stormfield edition, which is the trade version of the Gabriel Wells edition from 1929. I have the Memorial edition from 1929. They did 90 sets. Each one had an unpublished manuscript leaf by Twain. And this is the other version of the um, Limp Leather Library. There were two versions of it. No time to go into the details there. The next thing that I have are, is the collected edition of 1899. It was limited to uh, 512 sets. They were issued in a variety of luxury bindings. This was kind of an art deco binding. It has silk doublures and silk end papers. It was limited to 512 signed sets. This particular set once belonged to the great humorist Robin Williams. This set is the edition deluxe version. This is the Underwood edition. This is the Riverdale edition. They issued 22 volumes and added three, 22 and added three, 22 and added three. These were published a few years later. These were not issued in dust jackets so far as I know they were issued in the cellophane jacket. This is the Royal edition. That's the library edition. This is the Hillcrest edition in the red leather binding. This is the Hillcrest edition large paper issue. This is the Hillcrest edition in a green leather binding. This is the English version of the author's edition, which is also signed, 600 uh, sets. The Hillcrest edition was also issued in cloth with a paper label and cloth with a faux leather label. The reason this set is not in great shape is because it's a Langdon family set inscribed to his uh, Tain's nephew by, uh, by Twain in the first volume. This is the largest inscribed photograph I have of Twain. It's a silver print. Silver prints contained four layers, one of paper, one of barium sulfate, 
another layer, which was the silver halide crystals, which actually formed the image, and then an overcoat or a top coat. So they covered it first with the, the barium. The image was then, they put the light sensitive silver crystals on it that formed the image. But before uh, top coating it, they had to wash the excess crystals off, apply a fixative so it would stick. They could then tint the image, and this is a tinted image. His hair is white, his face has a very faint trace of pink, and the coat has a very face tra uh, uh, faint trace of brown. They could also, the, phot the photographer could sign it, Twain inscribed it, and then someone erased the name of the person he inscribed it to, and then a copyright notice. But this is a 16 by 20 silver print. It's called a mammoth print. It's the largest inscribed photo of Twain that I've seen. I also have the 128 Twain miniatures. And I have a photograph, an original carpet, uh, sorry, a cabinet photo of Twain and his famous sealskin coat with the fur out, which I framed in a Victorian frame with velvet, with the velvet out. And I must remind everyone again that all of the framed items, even the frames and antique, even the photographs in the antique frames uh, are sleeved in mylar uh, to prevent any acid migration. This is a Rookwood vase that Twain bought during the Twain cable tour and sent back to Quarry Farm. This is a carafe from the Quaker City brought home by a woman in upstate New York who apparently, I don't know if she got it for free because it was chipped or if she stole it in her luggage. It's the only surviving relic I know of from the Quaker City, which was the first American cruise. This is one of two images that I know of, original images of the frontispiece to Huckleberry Finn. This, was in, this one is inscribed on the back to Twain's uh, mother-in-law, Libby's mother. This is an image. It's unpublished, so you'll only get a brief look at it. And it's Twain after he got a haircut. He does not look happy. But the person who was his barber in Elmira in 1895, which is when this picture was taken, was the son of Auntie Cord. So when you hear that Twain heard the story from Auntie Cord, remember that her son, the son that she lost and then found, was Twain's barber. It makes you wonder if Twain maybe knew the story before he provoked Auntie Cord into telling it. Maybe he had heard it from the son himself. People do talk to their barbers, of course. Here I have a lot of original illustrations to Twain's works. A Kimball illustration from the first edition of Huck Finn, Kimball illustration from the 1896 edition, along with his letter accepting the contract. A letter from the, I mean, an illustration from the scriptural panoramas where the guy, the pianist, misses his cue and the guy strangles him. The Eskimo maiden's tale, telling her tale to Mark Twain. And a guy whose shadow froze on the deck, uh, which is mentioned in Following the Equator. This is by A.B. Frost, a prominent American artist. But the best thing on this wall is the last time Twain signed his name, Mark Twain. He inscribed this photograph on April 9th, 1910, just before he left Bermuda to return home. Payne had arrived on April 4th uh, to, to pick him up and they left on the 12th. This was the last time Twain signed his name Mark Twain. He signed some legal papers and perhaps a check for the, for the Mark Twain Library after that, but those would have been signed S.L. Clemens. And on his deathbed, he wrote brief notes asking for a pitcher of water and his glasses, but those were not signed. So the last time Mark Twain was Mark Twain uh, with pen and ink. It was probably right here on that photograph. As we come around the corner, this is a little bill of lading from the Mark Twain steamboat that Twain saw on the Mississippi, uh, which resulted in life on the Mississippi. He mentions it in life on the Mississippi. It's dated the 23rd of April, 1882. Twain saw this boat on the 21st of April, 1882, and he was on his way to Memphis. This boat was just north of Memphis. This boat, Twain arrived in Memphis on the 22nd and left on the 23rd, and this boat arrived in Memphis on the 23rd. It then turned around after taking the gold that's, that's listed in this bill of lading and headed back up north, because it was just a little packet boat 100 feet long. But the big steamboat, the gold dust that Twain was on, that was about 200 feet long, headed on down to New Orleans where it arrived on the 28th. If we come through here, there's 1882 silhouettes of Livy and Twain photographs inscribed by Twain to Isabel Lyon, a Coburn photograph that Jean Clemens inscribed to Lyon's mother. I'm showing this shelf for a very different reason. It shows the Tauschnitz editions, the English language European editions and wrappers and in cloth. This is the armed services editions which were given free to American soldiers in the Second World War. 
these are little blue books, every issue, every permutation of those things, which are hideous to try to collect and gather and study. And all of the various Grosset and Dunlap editions of Twain's books <clears throat> starting in the 1920s. And the reason I'm showing those in this Tauschitz edition is inscribed by Twain. The reason I'm showing those is because these books probably spread Twain's writings to an audience of people, European tourists, American GIs, people who could only afford 10 cents for a book and people who could only afford 50 cents or a dollar for a book. These books spread Twain's fame and readership far beyond the books that he published with Harper Brothers, the first editions of his books and others. These were mass marketed books that reached a huge audience. So they are significant, even though they're not terribly valuable. And these shelves are all of the original um, uh, periodical appearances of Mark Twain in the Atlantic Monthly, North American Review, Harper's Monthly, The Galaxy, and uh, many other more obscure journals. And I have all of them. I have a lot of uh, uh, reviews of Twain's works, but I don't collect them in the bound volumes. I prefer to get them in the original wrappers because you get a little more that way. In this section, we have editions of 1601. For some reason, this book has attracted a lot of attention. Printers love it. It's been printed by a variety of printers, but it's basically a fart joke. Queen Elizabeth and her courtiers are sitting around and somebody breaks wind. It turns out to be Sir Walter Raleigh. And they have a long discussion of who it was that farted. It's a fart joke. It's puerile. It's really immature. Why Twain and all of his friends thought that this thing was hilarious, I will never know. But it's a Twain work, it needs to be preserved with his works. I have a bunch of significant editions, over 200 of them. There were four copies printed in proof in 1880, and I have one with Twain's writing on it. I have the 1882 edition, which was issued on laid paper and uh, wove paper, and I have both of those. I have the 1894 edition, which came on Japan vellum and on paper. I have the night, that thunderstorm may be coming in. I have the 1901 edition in five different variants. I have the 1903 Swiverdale edition in all four variants. And we will just fast forward to the Grabhorn Press edition. There were 100 copies of that. I have all four variants. There were three variants of the copies of leather. And the Derrydale Press edition, which came in an edition of 30 copies, 100 copies, and a wrapper edition. And then I have a family copy. I also have down here the archive for uh, Twain's trip across America with James B. Pond at the beginning of his Round the World lecture tour. That's what those are. This is the Langdon family archive. Each box here represents a member of the Langdon family or a place. It's full of photographs, letters, documents, uh, that kind of thing. And these shelves are stuffed, or these uh, clamshell boxes are stuffed full of prospectuses, flyers, programs, menus, trade cards. Here are the Mark Twain comic books, the lawyer's archive for the 1899 edition, the collected edition of Twain's work. On this shelf, is Clara's archive, all of her autograph photographs from her time in Germany of artists and people that she met, including uh, Tolstoy, and then all of her, uh, just a variety of documents and archives pertaining to her work, all of her letters to the Gilder family, all of her letters to the uh, Carolyn Harnsberger, who was an early Twain uh, amateur uh, historian, and some letters to some other family members, plus books from Clara's library. On these shelves, the Mark Twain scrapbook. I have more than 50 different varieties of the book. It came in a variety of sizes and a variety of cover designs, some of them quite elaborate and some of them rather interesting. Here's one showing a little boy pushing a girl around on a sled. It looks like an invalid chair. And she wanted to go ice, uh, ice skating, so he took her. This is the very first one that was issued and it was inscribed by Dan Sloat, who was the printer. But my all-time favorite of the Mark Twain scrapbooks is the one that has a frog reading a book sitting on a toadstool. I guess he's not a frog, I guess he's a toad. We'll come around the corner and all of the books that you see here are books from Mark Twain's library. Can't go into great detail here, but I can touch the highlights. A book that may have inspired Prince and the Pauper, Arabian Nights, a Jane Austen book, we know what Twain thought about Jane Austen, an annotated book about Artemis Ward, a book of Robert Browning poems that Twain inscribed with his daughter Susie in lieu of a mud turtle, he said. 
read in the book with more than 4,000, really about 4,800 markings by Twain. Uh, Catullus, Twain used the name Catullus for the name of a cat in a, in a cat story. Cervantes, which was a great influence on Twain. Books on the supernatural origins of Christianity, the great religions of the world. Dana's Two Years Before the Mass, which provided Twain with one of his great speeches. Uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, a first edition of Sister Carrie, first printing, 1900. A Bret Hart book, a book about a steamboat trip in which Twain excoriates Bret Hart, says the writing is just as bad as Bret Hart. A book Twain inscribed to uh, his daughter posing as a cat. A uh, Longfellow book. I'm sorry, this one is a book about a little boy who grew up, told he was funny, took on a pen name, performed on the stage, became very famous, and had a strained marriage. Twain inscribed that particular book, if you see any parallels between Twain's life, but he didn't have a strained marriage, I don't think. But he inscribed that book to Isabel Lyon, his private secretary. This is a Howells book in which Howells said that people are interested in a woman's past, but they're interested in a man's future. And beside that remark, Twain wrote, Howells is going to get shot one of these days. Here we have a Bible in which Libby annotated uh, the daughter's progress. We have, uh, in reading and memorizing Bible verses, we have Caesar's commentaries, Twain's copy of a book that was made and produced by Indians, American Indians, and have a Holmes book inscribed to Libby by Twain, recorded uh, with the poems of Olive Wendell Holmes. I have the Bostonians. Twain famously said he'd rather spend the eternity in Bunyan's Hell than finish reading the Bostonians. Here's a book, international episode, that he inscribed for Livy. This is the last book that Livy gave Twain as a Christmas gift. This book may also be the last book that Twain gave to Livy as a Christmas gift. They both date from Christmas 1903. Livy died a few months later. First edition of Call of the Wild, Twain inscribed to his daughter Jean. Madam Butterfly. This is a copy of Mark Twain's New England Tragedies, which is the book Twain was reading at the moment that social Jimmy knocked on his door. It's a story about Quaker persecution. A little black boy knocks on his door to bring him his dinner at the hotel where he's staying. Twain makes notes in this book about their conversation, tears the notes out, writes up his story, sends it off to the newspaper, mails the book back to Livy. And of course, when he wrote Huck Finn, there are Quaker themes um, all throughout it. And it's been persuasively argued that Little Sociable Jenny is one of the African-American voices that influenced the voice of Huck Finn. Another book that he gave to Isabel Lyon, uh, this is Marshall's Epigrams. There are two epigrams in Marshall's Epigrams that have to do with farting. And then we have Paradise Lost. Twain named Paradise Lost as a classic. That is a book we wish we had read but don't want to read. I don't know if Twain read this. It was Livy's book. The Golden Treasury, that's a book that Twain brought back with him on the ship when he was returning from Italy after Livy's death. And he annotated a lot of the poems that had death themes. Gulliver's Travels, two copies of Ben-Hur, a first edition and a later printing that he gave to one of his angel fish, Dorothy Quick. A book, an anthology that includes uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's love poems. A copy of Leaves of Grass, a book that, that uh, Livy inscribed on behalf of Langdon Clemens. Uh, Twain's son, who died in infancy. I also have a glass plate negative of Langdon that has not been published. Thomas Nast's biography by Albert Bigelow Payne inscribed to Twain. It's the book that got Payne his job as, as Twain's official biographer. On the last shelf section, Hull's Explorations of North America, which was a book that uh, Twain used in Life on the Mississippi, and it has, he marks the steamboat passage on the Mississippi, showing what, patch of, what path they followed going upriver and downriver. Franklin's autobiography, which was influential in his work. This is probably the Rosetta Stone to all of Twain's writings. It's Twain's copy of Leckie's History of European Morals. Twain's annotations in this book are explicit. They don't need any explication by scholars to explain what they mean. He talks about God, slavery, determinism, and he's very explicit in his remarks. In this book, The Letters of James Russell Lowell, it's annotated by Twain with his thoughts on suicide. And just for grins, a Walter Scott book. We know what Twain thought of Walter Scott. Twain also had an edition of Balzac, mostly with Claire's annotations, but owned and in the household during Twain's lifetime. This is uh, 
Cough Celebre, uh, Cough Celeb, and it's a history of a collection of many, many stories taken from trials, sensational headlines, murders, impostors, all kinds of crooks. If you read those stories, you will see, excuse me, over and over stories that Twain uses in his own writings. Clara is Chopin, she is a, Twain went back to the house to recover what he called a big red book for Clara when she wanted her Chopin sheet music brought to her. That brings us to the end of Twain's library. The next thing I'll show you, we're getting Clay now, is a photograph of Twain at his desk in 1906. We're gonna see that desk in a second. You can see the handle that sticks up and part of the uh, cabriole leg with a ball and claw foot. And these pictures show a library table that belonged to Susan Langdon that she later gave to Twain. You can also see a statue up here on the mantel. And you'll see that statue here looking at Twain in his study in 1874. And then the study got remodeled, but the statue got put back on the mantel in 1903. See a card table up here with Twain playing cards with three of his angel fish, including Louise Payne and Joy Payne. The table passed to Joy Payne and passed to her descendants from whom I acquired it. Here's that desk again, that distinctive chair, the cabriole leg, that was Twain's desk at Stormfield in 1908. Some of Twain's possessions that I can point out are a key that he was given when he opened a library in England at Kinsel Rise, his gold Phi Beta Kappa key, his Stormfield guest book, which he first called Innocence at Home, some angelfish jewelry. This was Twain's own pen that he wore this was Clara's pen or pendant. This was Isabel Lyons' hat pen. And this was Joy Payne's uh, little stick pen. This is a fan signed by everybody in the family but Livy, plus uh, Theodore Lechitsky, who was Clara's piano teacher. And it's also signed by Arthur Schnabel, who taught my piano teacher. And Theodore Lechitsky also taught my first piano teacher. And so I feel personally connected to uh, uh, some of those pianists because of my own training. But it's signed by everybody but Livy. It was signed in 1898. It was common to autograph opera fans. Can't prove it, but I think it was probably Livy's opera fan, so she's the only person who didn't sign it. These are photographs from Twain's personal archive, including photogra his photographs of himself with John T. Lewis. Other photographs from the archive, Twain with Booker T. Washington. This is Jean's Italian photograph journey, photograph journal with annotations by Twain, he went in and edited and changed some of the words for her. I don't know if she appreciated that. This is a color photograph of Twain that I can't show because it's too complicated to get it out and it won't show well on the screen. It's an autochrome taken a week before Coburn came to take his autochromes. It's the first color photograph of Twain. It is stunning. It shows his yellow mustache stained from cigar smoke, it shows his pink skin, it shows his blue eyes. This is a little bank owned by Jean a crumb sweep owned by Livy with engravings to her. This all came from Clara's estate. These are not really opera glasses. They are binoculars. They're four by 36, which is a little more powerful and larger than typical opera glasses. Punch ladle that they got in Scotland in 1873. Salt and pepper shakers that Livy was given by her mother in 1876. These are two spoons given to Clara for her birthday and for Christmas, two spoons given to Susie for her birthday and Christmas, and two spoons given to Jean for her birthday and Christmas. A cake cutter by Tiffany, given to Clara for, I think, for a birthday. And two spoons that Twain was given when he went back to Hannibal in 1902. One with an image of the home and the other one inscribed to him personally. Over here, well, let's go first to the table. <clears throat> this is a library table. Came from the Langdon family and it was kept at Quarry Farm. Twain's student lamp is on top of it. And this is the table that Susan Crane gave him that you saw in the picture. It has a pull-out platform for writing. You have ink splatters all over it and the drawing of a fence style. A fence styles appear in Twain's works. The most famous one occurs in Huckleberry Finn when Huck discovers a boot print with a cross on it that indicates that Pat Finn, his drunken murderous father, is back in town and coming after Huck. And that initiates Huck's uh, fleeing uh, when his father locks him up and Huck famously uh, fakes his own murder. But if I ever come here and find a boot printer in Exeter, I am going to light out for the territory myself. But it's a remarkable artifact that has ink stains, and it's probably 
something that Twain used in the evenings of the correspondence. He did most of his creative writing in the study. We come around over here. This is a silk that Twain was given when he visited the Oxford University Press. This is an award of merit given to Twain by a cartoonist who was really self-serving for the cartoonist, not for Twain. A portrait by Frank Whitmore of Twain in 1885. A mahogany mirror that may have been purchased by Twain and Libby or may have passed down in Libby's family, probably hung in the mahogany room at the Twain house in Hartford. We don't know for sure. An ivory statue of Tom Sawyer. Here are the two statues that um, we don't know who gave it to him, though. A statue of Evangeline, who figures into Twain's works. This is the statue that we saw a picture of earlier, sitting on the mantel. This, this woman here, probably Libera, who was a Roman goddess of wine because she's standing next to a wine press. She watched Twain write all of his creative works in that study. Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, um, Prince and the Pauper, and so on. A gilded chalice that Twain was given at a dinner. Here is the card table that you saw in that photograph earlier with Twain playing cards with his angelfish. And we'll end with Twain's desk, Chippendale desk that was sold by Clara in 1851, I'm sorry, 1951. Blank stationery, including one from Stormfield, a pen that Twain used from 1868 to 1885. There are some burn marks on the surface and there are also ink splatters so he was just as careless with his ink and his cigars here as he was. I'll move that out of the way so you can see the, the burn marks. I'll put the pen in the ink tray. This was Twain's inkwell in the 1870s and 80s. Twain's glasses. These glasses may be the glasses that appear on his desk at Quarry Farm in a picture in 1901 taken by Thomas Moreau. You can see the glasses and you can also see their carrier and you can even see the flap uh, on them. And a pipe that Twain gave to an elevator operator, uh, an Otis elevator, a guy named George Williams, who was a friend of the Spaldings and Clara. And that passed down to an early member of the Mark Twain Society. So I think we're more concerned about the ink Twain got onto the paper than the ink he spilt on his belongings. Uh, and with that, I will yield to questions. That was so wonderful, Kevin. Thank you so much for that tour. I'm the chat has not been, we have lots of questions. The chat has not been very active, but I am sure that everybody is just stunned into silence. <laughs> so, um, questions. Okay, the first ask, one. Oh, oh go ahead. Whirlwind pace. I was moving at a whirlwind pace. I know I went very, very fast. Couldn't show you all 10,000 items, but I wanted to give an overview to give an idea of the scope and the depth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first question um, with two votes from uh, Kit is, do you have many items from the Western years? Very few survive. Um, I have the laws of Nevada. I have the second Nevada territory directory, which lists Twain living there and includes advertisements from all the companies and uh, businesses that were there in Carson City and in Virginia City. I have two issues of the Virginia Territorial Enterprise, one other besides the one I showed you, uh, but there's very little documentation. I think the earliest claim letter I have dates from 1868 or 69. The earliest lecture ticket that I have for Twain comes from his first formal lecture, his first formal lecture tour in 1868 in California. So anything from that 1862-63 period uh, is pretty uh, scant. There's not much out there. I have very, very little. All right. Uh, the second question, um, again, with two votes from our audience, uh, asked by Peter, is what is your favorite volume for its Twain annotations? My favorite volume, I'm sorry. annotations it's the lecky because the lecky as i described it is the rosetta stone his his comments on determinism his comments on slavery that it uh, uh, harms the slaveholder more than it harms the slave uh, determinism he spells it out explicitly in his notations uh, he talks about god and religion western morals uh, the 
the Lecky history of European morals is kind of a Kenneth Clark type overview of Western morality. And Twain read it four times in the 1870s, again in the late 80s, again at some unknown point, and again in 1906. So it's a book that he read thoroughly and read repeatedly. And uh, scholars have traced its influence on Huckleberry Finn and among other books. But I think it's, um, it probably tells us more about Twain's thoughts on the, the most important topics that influenced his writing than any other book that's annotated. The book that gives me a sense of immediacy, of course, is the Longfellow book, because I know he was reading that at the moment that Social Jimmy knocked on his door. And I know that the Quaker themes, and I wrote an essay, well, it's about Quaker, uh, exploring all the Quaker themes in Huckleberry Finn. And that book was the touchstone to that research. So that book, even though it's not, um, it has a few pencil markings and things in it, not nearly as valuable as the Leckie or some other books, not a very impressive looking book, uh, but it has a lot of meaning to me. Great. Oh my goodness, there are so many questions. Um, uh, it says, I may have missed it, but do you own any locks of Twain's or his family member's hair? <laughs> I'm trying to clone Twain as we speak. Uh, <laughs> good, good. Inside one of the salt and pepper shakers, I have a little Petri dish kind of a situation going with the Twain hair. I actually do have one hair of Twain, and it was tangled in the silk ribbon for that Kinsel Rise Sterling Silver Library key. And it had to be Twain's because they would have taken that uh, key out of the case that it's in and took taken this long silk ribbon and probably put it over his neck um, and his hair would have gotten tangled. Now whether that hair broke off or has a root, that would tell us whether or not it has DNA. I know there's a, a lock of Twain's hair that is at the Mark Twain papers, but all I have is that one single hair. Problem was it kept falling off. Every time I'd touch the thing or move it, that hair would come loose. So I took a needle, a sewing needle, and I looped the hair in it like a thread and looped it a couple of times in the silk just to make sure it stayed there. I didn't tie it in, but I just kind of looped it in. There is an outside possibility that that hair got there from Clara when she was very old. Can't be sure. But I suspect that Clara didn't wear that key around her neck. I suspect that's probably Twain's. Great. All right. Um, it says, could you say something about the Canadian pirate editions? I have all of the Canadian and English pirate editions. I have Twain's correspondence. Um, uh, I have a lawyer's correspondence uh, regarding his lawsuit against the Canadian pirates, which he lost because he sued them on the basis of it being uh, a trademark. And he was trying to, his name was trademarked, but not copyrighted. You can copyright your writings, and the trademark has to be applied to vendable properties. Uh, uh, writings or intellectual because uh, he was he was pursuing it the wrong way uh, as a trademark instead of copyright and i have a when twain was living in canada he wrote living a letter and sent her some clippings uh and i have that and i have all of the canadian pirate editions they circulated in america uh, most of the ones that i have that have owner descriptions have american ownership inscriptions rather than canadian and at least one that I can recall was purchased on a railroad, so my or a railroad car. I suspect that they were probably sold at news depots and aboard trains, which was common for cheap books to be sold aboard trains. I have some advertising leaflets for Twain's own books uh, for stolen white elephant being sold on a train. So I think uh, the Canadian editions probably circulated in America, competed with Twain's own works, much to his irritation. Awesome. Um, so Ron has asked, where are the largest collections located that can be visited? Well, they're in Hartford, the Mark Twain Papers, Hannibal, my own. There are some private collectors who have Twain material. I don't know that they're open to be visited. Um, most of them are focused more on books than on letters or photographs. None of them have the kind of scope or depth that mine does. Uh, mine's a little over the top. Uh, most collectors can find themselves to books and first printings and then collect some photographs and autographs and things to kind of go with the books, but they don't really uh, try to get everything. Uh, and I didn't set out to do that. It just sort of happened along the way. I started in 1968 when I was 15. I'm 67 now. So that's what happens if you stick with it long enough. 
Yeah. Uh, so into that, uh, starting collecting at 15, what was your first significant Twain collection, like item that you got? Well, the first Twain book that I saw, I didn't buy. It was a copy of Mark Twain's speeches, 1923, in a dust jacket. It was $5, which would be a bargain now. That would be worth several hundred dollars. And I saw it, but I bought a different book in that bookshop instead because I didn't have the money to buy both books. So I chose the other book, not the Twain. But I regretted that so much that I started looking for Twain material and started buying it. I don't remember what the first Twain book was that I actually bought after that. I do remember that the first book that I bought from Twain's library was The Artemis Ward. I bought that in 1971 or 72 from Max Hunley, a dealer who had actually attended the 1951 Hollywood sale, uh, where Clara sold off a lot of books. Great. Um, I think one of the questions here was, how did you, how were you able to collect so many volumes from Twain's personal library? I bought a lot of, Nick Kranovich and I were kind of head in head on books from Mark Twain's library. And uh, when Nick passed away, I attended his sale. I bought about half of the books that he had, which was about 60 volumes. And um, I've, I've watched for them at auction. A lot of people know I collect Twain, so I get quoted a lot of material. A lot of material is brought my way um, by private sale and by families, descendants of the Langdon family, um, the uh, heirs of Clara Clemens estate and uh, Albert Bigelow Payne's descendants uh, and other descendants of business associates and friends of Twain uh, have come to me with material. They've been referred to me or they've heard my name. And so I acquire a lot of material directly. I bought a lot of it at auction. Um, a few things have showed up on eBay, but not many. And that's swimming with sharks. You have to know what you're doing there. Yeah. And just being in the book trade for years and years, they've come from all directions. Um, I've bought them for as little as six dollars. Uh, they sometimes go unrecognized for what they are. You open up a book and it has Livy's name, Olivia Clemens, in the front of it, written in Twain's distinctive handwriting. But the person who's selling it doesn't recognize who Olivia Clemens is. Right. So that book cost me twenty-five dollars. That was the Henry James International episode. But other books. Um, they just come from a variety of sources. Uh, there's no single uh, source or answer to that question. A lot of the books from Twain's library, by the way, got in circulation in 1911 at a big sale of his books. And they got in circulation again in 1951 when Clara had her big sale. And they got into circulation again in the later 1950s when the Mark Twain Library in Reading had a library duplicate sale and mistakenly sold a bunch of books from Twain's library without realizing that's what was happening. And those books are out there. They can show up anywhere at any time. I think people will get a much better picture of what's out there and where those books are circulated when Alan Gribben's final two volumes of Mark Twain's library appear yes. uh, by the end of this year. Yes, I know I'm awaiting that that book. I think it'll be great. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So people keep answering questions, so we're not we're not getting down. Um, what do you consider your most treasured and or most surprising item in your collection? Uh, favorite items, I guess, is the way I could describe it. Would be the letter from Twain to the little young lady who wrote him about Huck Finn, because it goes to the core of Twain's outlook, looking at things from a child's outlook, which is how Huck Finn is written. The book that Twain inscribed to John T. Lewis is probably my favorite book because of John T. Lewis being a spiritual model for Jim and Jim being the heart of Huckleberry Finn. He's the moral center of the book. Everything that's good and moral and decent comes from Jim and nowhere else in that book. And for that book, for Twain to inscribe that book, someone that he admired so much as he did John Lewis, to inscribe that book to him, Grant, the, the the savior of the American Civil War to flee black people from slavery uh, at a time when he probably still thought that uh, John T. Lewis had been a slave. I think that book is a favorite of mine. Of course, the Lecky is my favorite book from Twain's library along the Longfellow. My favorite photograph is the color photograph, the autochrome, because it's so stunning and vibrant. Probably my favorite, my favorite object is the statue. 
him study. I figured it was somehow crazy. Uh, watched him write all of his greatest works. The most surprising thing I found is I bought a batch of documents that pertained to Quarry Farm and the Langdon family and so forth. And they were mostly deeds and legal papers. They were all folded up. And some people had gone through them and hadn't found anything interesting. They were just more landed family than anything else. But I was unfolding them and, and uh, dusting them off, going through them. And I found one that was uh, Twain and Olivia had both signed it, uh, signing over their rights uh, for the Langdon home in downtown uh, Elmira, probably in return for uh, uh, giving up their rights to Quarry Farm and giving up their rights to other things. Uh, and that was a complete surprise, finding a, a document signed by both Sam and Libby uh, that I already had in my collection and didn't know was there. So in terms of surprise, that was a shock. Uh, but in terms of favorite things, those are my favorite photographs, book, book Great. library, and, and relic. Yeah. Um, how many miniature story pocket booklets were published for the soldiers? I'd have to go count half a dozen, maybe seven. Um, Great. They were just maps. They were designed to fit in a uniform pocket. A lot of them were oblong for that reason, so you could stick it in a pants pocket. Most of those books you find in pretty poor shape for obvious reasons. Um, they're not terribly expensive. They're fairly easy to find. And um, I don't know how many books were issued in the Armed Services editions. There's a bibliography of the entire series. Uh, I think six or seven, I think is the right number. I, I don't tend to count things. The only reason I have numbers that I could give people at the beginning of this tour is because I was going to give this tour, so I had to sit down and count up what I had <laughs> because I know people tend to think in quantitative terms. I don't sit around counting what I have or think of it that way. Um, so yeah. it was kind of a revelation to me to count things up and say, oh, I've got X number of this or X number of that. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you just mentioned a bibliography. So uh, one of the questions is, what is the best Twain bibliography out there for collectors? Two, and I wrote one of them. The first one I would recommend is BAL, the Bibliography of American Literature, Volume 2, published in 1957, but easily acquired as a used book. And in that section is a bibliography of Twain's works. It is reasonably accurate. It is understandably 1957. It's a little out of date. But that's the place to start. BAL, Bibliography of American Literature, published by Yale University Press, Volume 2. The other thing to look for are two issues of a magazine called First Magazine. The first one was published in 1998. There were two issues. I wrote a long kind of updating the information in BAL and giving the publication. In 2008, I did a third issue, a complete issue of the, the magazine was devoted to Mark Twain. And in 2008, I wrote a, an update, a 10-year retrospective on what had occurred in Twain studies and what had been discovered in Twain bibliography. So between the two 1998 issues of First and the 1908, uh, I'm sorry, the 2008 issue of First, those three magazine issues, which you can buy at the First magazine website, uh, plus BAL, gives you a pretty good uh, handle on Twain bibliography. A distant third would be the 1935 edition of Merle Johnson's bibliography. It has some useful information, but you have to be cautious in using it. A lot of it's out of date and inaccurate. But he tells some good stories behind the books. But anything that's in Merle Johnson is trumped by what you find in the bibliography of American literature. All right, we are, I mean, we're already over an hour, so we're gonna do maybe two more questions and then um, I'll try to copy them and, and get some answers and put them in the chat for later. But um, one uh, second to last question, do you have correspondence from Ernest Allen Clemens, his nephew whom lived, I'm assuming that's supposed to be on his ranch in New Mexico? No, I've not seen any correspondence like that. That was a short and sweet answer, cool. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, and then, uh, so our good friend, John Pascal, 
us if you're on a desert island with one twain book, which is it and why? <laughs> oh, John, John, John. <laughs> oh. Probably a collection of his sketches, maybe sketches new and old, if I think about it. Uh, or maybe the Lou Bud edition, the two volume, that would be it. The two volume collection of sketches of short works by Twain, edited by Lou Bud. And my reason for that is that I know Huck Finn backwards and forwards and Tom Sawyer and Prince of the Pauper and all of the longer works. I've read them. I can't quite recite them. I can recite part of Paradise Lost, the man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree that brought death into the world and all our woe. But I, I can't recite Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, but I know the books. But the sketches, I haven't read every short story, and every time I read them, some of them make me laugh. I think the history of the good little boy uh, who failed to prosper and the story of the bad little boy who certainly did prosper are hilarious. They, I just think they're funny every time I read them. I think Grandfather's Old Ram. I think uh, Lifting Poultry. I think that, you know, all, all of those short stories, um, because I don't read them that frequently, um, and you can read them all, you know, in any one of them in a single sitting. Um, they're just well told, and uh, they seem new to me every time I read them. Uh, the longer works, you know, we've all read them, we've read the studies about them, um, we know what they're about. Um, so I don't think we have to have the text handy. But the short works, I think that's what I want to have at my own book. Wonderful. So I just copied and pasted the questions that are remaining. So I will, I'll get, I'll get Kevin to answer some of them and I'll put them in the chat because of course this was recorded. So if you missed any part of it or just want to go back and, and watch Kevin again, it'll be available um, for you to, to go back and watch. Um, I will plug again that donation button. If you enjoy these virtual programs, every dollar helps to keep us doing virtual programs, even when we go back into the auditorium and go back to, to live programs. So um, there's that. And the last thing I will mention, since we ended with a, uh, a question from our good friend, John, I will plug his Trouble Begins, which will be next month, June 23rd, 5.30, right here on Crowdcast. I'm putting the link into the chat box there. Um, and thank you so much, Kevin. This was fantastic. It was so great. I think this is the most questions we've had at one of these events. So I... Everybody's thanking you in the chat. It was absolutely superb. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Great. All right. Good night.